Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Today's topic is resisting through our bodies. Um, we have a panel of uh, guests um, from Creative Arts Therapies and across the university um, who are going to. Uh, today's session is brought to us by the Board of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Let me just uh, throw it over to our panel. Uh, Tana Bell, take it away. Hi, welcome everyone to this Tuesday topics. Um, before we start, I just want to address the nature of this activity. Um, so as a creative art therapist, international, older student, bisexual, cisgender, single mother from Guatemala, Central America. I am very interested in understanding fully the experience of marginalization because uh, all the intersecting social identities and locations usually end up in experiences um, called microaggressions. Um, so I love having this strong, emotionally engaging conversations about these matters. And I really think that we might benefit um, from just having these conversations because the discomfort around microaggressions is well, uncomfortable uh, to say the least. I mean, uncomfortable, or uncomfortable for the people that get called out or called in or called forward. Um, but more important microaggressions are painful and traumatic for the people that experience them. So I have noticed, and um, Ray Johnson's uh, text and articles have confirmed that whenever there's like a power differential, it's more common or frequent that microaggressions happen, right? Power differential. So that's why I don't think that having a conversation about dismantling oppression through a hierarchical, I had to, I had to practice like, seven times to say that word because in Spanish it's so different, so hierarchical and very structured conversation, I think might not serve this purpose. Um, so in that sense, I am proposing that this space be like a horizontal organic space for human interactions between all these beautiful people uh, that accepted to engage in this casual conversation about how to deal, how to understand, how to navigate this blindsided uh, slash painful experiences called microaggressions. So that being said, I will be your conversational weaver this afternoon, and I welcome you to this virtual space um, where you will be able to follow an ongoing conversation between Ray Johnson um, they are a social worker, somatic movement therapist, board certified coach and scholar activist working at the intersection and of embodiment and social justice. Um, we also have Blair Chase. He's a Drexel professor. Uh, he's a couples and family therapy PhD candidate and an art therapist. And my peer colleagues and officers of the Student Association Creative Arts Therapists of Color, aka Cats of Color, Hannah, Janika, and Farhan. So welcome all for our viewers and audience. If at any moment of the conversation you feel compelled to participate, please use the chat box. Um, I'll try to weave to, with the best of my abilities. And if you want your voice to be heard and recorded, uh, we'll leave um, some time at the end for Q&A. And um, so why don't we start by addressing what and why did the invitation to this conversation appeal to you? I'm happy to start us off if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and I think the first thing that I want to just say is, is a thank you and appreciation to you, Tony Bell, and, and to the rest of the Cats of Color. Um, because this is the second time that you've invited me to come and have conversation with you. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed um, the engagement with, with all of you as a group 
And, and so that's part of why um, I said yes to this second invitation was because my, my earlier conversations felt so, um, so authentic and um, really insightful and personal. And, and I think in, in many ways, for me, that feels like a um, sort of a, an essential component of how to have the difficult conversations about microaggressions when they occur sort of in the first place is that I, I don't think of these things as events and experiences that have a formula that you can use for when they happen, here's what you do. I think, and, and, and my own experience and, and the conversations that I've had with, with other folks around microaggressions suggest that even if you quote unquote, say all the right things, that saying all the right things is no replacement for actually being able to be with people, to be present and real and there. And that has to always happen. And there's always sort of varying degrees of how safe that feels for you to be. Um, but there was something in the quality of the conversations that I've had with you all already and that we all had last week that just felt so um, so hopeful and so full of possibility that, um, that I'm really looking forward to this one. And, and also Tony Bell, uh, really appreciating your thoughtfulness around making this a conversation rather than a presentation. And I think in, in many ways, what you describe as that horizontality is a model for how we wanna do this work. And so I think it's, it's great that you're changing how we approach doing work around power difference by immediately shifting the structure so the power difference shifts. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. I feel happiness in my body as I hear you. Uh, I, I can go. Um, and I, I think you know, for me, the the uh, the need to you know be on this panel and talk about you know microaggressions in such a way, especially as a um, a black male art therapist, and you know in the one percent working to get a doctorate degree. Um, one of the things I'm I'm really passionate about is how, you know not only black culture but you know just culture of people of color and how that how that is represented in terms of professionalism in professional in spaces, and you know. Um, combating this idea that professionalism looks one way and that, you know, our ability to bring in art culture and, and how we identify into the professional workspace is a benefit and an asset. Um, and just because it looks different than the traditional, um, you know, a way of what professionalism looks like, which is, you know, basically like, it look, if it looks white, it looks right, you know, <laughs> yep. you know, that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't have value in how I bring my culture and identity into these professional spaces. And I think that that is, you know, one of the main reasons why I felt this was really important for me to come and discuss. I can go next. Um, I'm Hannah. I started Cats of Color for my peers like the week of orientation when we entered this program because I knew we were headed into like a white dominated field and we were really going to meet each other. And so I think um, like microaggression is something that we've been talking about a lot, like within the school system, but also outside of it as professionals um, and how to navigate that and um, kind of go through it without, um, with, like while teaching others, but also um, self, like protecting ourselves as well. And so I'm interested in being a part of this conversation with everybody. Yeah, I think I similarly, oh, my name is Farhana. Um, I similarly, it feels really relevant to all of our experiences. We experience microaggressions and sometimes there's not always room for the nuanced conversations that oftentimes, especially microaggressions as I've experienced them in the classroom or in interpersonal relationships with, um, like in this context, it is it is so nuanced. It's not the blatant things that everybody can like, at and so I I think it's worth having building and creating spaces to have these conversations. So I'm excited to be here. And I'm um, Janika, and um, one of the 
things that drew me to this conversation. Um, I did a, what everyone else is saying has said um, thus far, and I just want to add the uh, the aspect of being the microaggressor and how to navigate um, repair um, is so important um, because we can easily um, shut off or deflect or um, just spiritually bypass um, another person and. And, and I, I'm here to like discuss how to how to not do those things. So I think like Farhana said, it's so relevant and it's a skill that we all need to build because it happens because there's always a power differential. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. There's always a power differential. So you cannot escape power differential. That it's gonna happen because of age, because of you know, all the isms that are embedded in our culture, you will always have a power differential. And it changes, like for me, it changes, it moves. It's not something static. Like uh, I never experienced uh, the type of microaggressions that I experienced here in the US, back in Guatemala. Like it shifted completely. So depending where, where you are, but, but if you are a US American uh, person and you are in Guatemala, you will not experience like a marginalized kind of experience because most usually you'll be there because of tourism or, you know, so you'll be regarded as, oh, a US American that has privilege. So I'm very curious about this changing, uh, this shifting uh, regarding the position of being microaggressed and becoming a microaggressor at any given moment with any given people. Like, how have you experienced this? Have you seen it? Have you seen the shift? I'll, I'll start um, by saying that because uh, the microaggressor experience, um, when I said it, um, I immediately thought about an experience where I was the aggressor. And I don't even think or know if the person that I aggressed picked up on it, because like you said, Tony Bell, it's very minute, it's very, you know, small. And I didn't even know until later that I had done it. Um, and I was, so the scenario was, I was in an elevator and I was on campus and I was, um, uh, so I was in an elevator, I think in a new college building and um, a professor, I didn't know this at the time, but she was another black woman, young looking and she had a tag on, but I didn't really pay attention to it. And we were talking about, um, she was a marriage and family therapist uh, professor. I hadn't known, but we were talking about that because I was, there was some, um, there was an interest and we, I just sparked up a conversation with her and I just kind of, you know, very shyly, are, are, what's, are, are you a student? Are you a professor, you know? And, and it was just very, like in my mind, I was like, oh, she's a student. Like, you know, she can't be a professor. And I, I didn't know I had those, those, that internal narrative, like, you know, I haven't um, seen a lot of like people my color being in such a high position and, and like talking like she knows what she's, what's going on. Um, and so like, it, I just put those things together. Like, I think I just committed a microaggression against her, like just kind of not even looking at the tag that clearly said professor such and such, you know? Um, and so, th yeah, that was very, very eye opening to me about you, how the, 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 the role of the aggressor and the aggressed can easily shift. One, you know, shifting as like me, I'm a black woman and I can definitely be microaggressed all the time in our society here. Um, but then again, you know, internalizing those, those narratives about, oh, where black people can go and where black people aren't. Um, yeah, so much to, to navigate there. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, I want to piggyback, I guess, piggyback off of, you know, more so of the emotion that you experienced about recognizing that you were the microaggressor and, you know, just the, the anxiety around, you know, the difference between the microaggressor versus the microaggressee and, you know, being the microaggressee, the, the, the feeling of onus of having to put the energy into 
addressing the microaggression that happened, even though that you're the victim. You know, I, I think about uh, a time in when I was in my master's program, getting my art therapy degree, and I was looking at um, practicums. I, it was, a, I think it was a Friday evening. I didn't have class. I had on sweatpants. I had on a hat. Just minding my own business, looking at the book. Um, one of the professors came in and, you know, she's like, oh, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing, just looking at, you know, practice and everything. She's like, well, you know, you can't wear that hat when you go into the interview, right? Mm -hmm. And I, my response immediately was like, yeah, I know. And then she left and I felt really odd. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, what just happened here? And to this day, she still doesn't know that, that that was actually not only the first time that I feel like I experienced microaggression that I could actually identify, but I feel like that was the first time that I experienced, like, I, you know, I guess like racism in that way of just being like that whole idea that I'm in this position of, you know, I'm in this program. I had to interview for this program. It's, it's a day off for me. And yet your comment to me is you can't wear this hat in this interview. And I think about how much energy I spent even having to think about even possibly having this dialogue with this person around, hey, like that didn't sit right with me. How, how do we discuss this when I was the one hurt and why do I have to have the onus of starting this dialogue? And how do we, you know, do a better job, you know, like in this, in Janika's case of being able to identify, oh man, like I did this thing, it wasn't intentional. And then how do we bring up those dialogues without feeling ashamed or, you know, just being able to say, that's my bad, I want to grow from it. I'm particularly impacted by, by the time uh, that this uh, takes uh, if one chooses to address a microaggression. It's like a time. It's, it's hopefully it will get better and better and we'll be faster and faster to be able to, hey, address it when it happens. But I guess it always cuts, cuts you in uh, off guard. Mm -hmm. and there's always a length of time that's needed like for you to process it and then be able to bring it up to that person and sometimes that can be a really long process and then you have to start that process kind of over again with the microaggressor that's really exhausting and a lot of emotional labor right, yeah. you've been sitting with it this whole time it's not you've been thinking about it at three o'clock in the morning and chewing on it like just the 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 metabolic cost from the time that it happens to the time that you get some closure on it mm -hmm. is really big. And so the fact that we call these microaggressions really completely negates the, the impact in terms of layering one paper cut over another, over you know old scar tissue, and just the amount of energy, emotional and psychological and relational labor that goes into trying to get these um, relational ruptures yeah. resolved. Yeah. Because you hear the comments, you hear the thing, whatever it is, and like you don't hear it at first, but then somehow it keeps on resonating in your head and you're like, hmm. And you start feeling something in your body like, huh, there, there's, the discomfort and there's like attention and it doesn't go away it starts like growing and growing and then your thought is like you said consumed and you know there's a metabolic excessive you know waste of energy because you're holding something tight and then if you do decide to call this um forward um like I had done this, this has happened to me. Like I have created like a, a map, like papers and notes, like to know, to not get lost because I was such in a pre-verbal state when everything happened that for me to be able to pull my courage and you know, my words and I'm a, and, and I'm a non-English speaker, like native. So English is not my first language. Like I have to put all these emotions into words that are not mine. So when I finally have all this done after, I don't know, two, three, seven days of thinking and, you know, processing with friends, I come up to, you know, the teacher and in the process of doing so, and uh, because my teachers are, are well-intentioned and they actually were not intending to harm me, they will try to 
explain why they did or said such a thing and they will keep on committing like another microaggression on top of another and another and another trying to explain what happened so i was like oh i had this microaggression going on and then i'm coming here to you to let you know and you're like oh, 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 oh. <sighs> yeah that's tiring and which I, I, loops I could... back to what Janika was saying about how important it is to do the work of how do we hear these? Like, how can we, how can we share some of the emotional, psychological labor by going, oh, okay, so what kind of things would be helpful if someone comes to me, having said to me, something you did felt wrong, this feels like a microaggression, can we talk about it? Which of course takes already a huge amount of courage and energy and it's scary and activating and all the rest of that. But when someone does that, how can we actually educate ourselves and practice in ourselves, build capacity in ourselves so that we don't make it worse? Because that's what I'm hearing you say, Tony Bell, is that, that your well-intentioned instructor made it worse. And, and I can and I can only imagine, you know, how difficult that even could have been, you know, when we started this conversation, you know, saying that there's always a position of power and to be the student and to have to come into that position to challenge a professor on, hey, this microaggression happened, it was real for me without the fears of how does this impact their view of me? How does this impact the department's view of me? How does this impact my grading, my schooling? You know, do they look at me differently now? Do they communicate with me differently now? Does that mean that now they're afraid to have meaningful dialogue with me where this is an important conversation for us to have? And there's all these different things. And by the time you finally figure it out, so much time has passed, you have to now recollect, you know, how did this thing happen again? Do they even remember? Do they even care? And you find yourself holding on to this thing that had happened so long ago. And it's still so pertinent and important to you, but this, you know, the microaggressor kind of goes and has no idea, all because we are trying to figure out how to express ourselves while not, um, you know, being put down because we're in a lesser position of power. Yeah, but power differential is so big with the student and teachers. I remember when, like, the cats of color were starting um, conversations with our professors about these kind of things happening in our department. Like, we were really worried about like this is gonna change how they perceive us. And we were especially worried about Janika because she's a black woman and the stereotype is, you know, they're loud, they're bossy, they're aggressive. And so like just knowing that even bringing these things up is gonna be changing how they see us from now on um, is such like, it's a big weight to bear, but it's like, you still have to bear it to move things forward. Yes, yes, I agree, Hannah. That's why we're here, but for example, I have found myself that in trying to do so, I developed this like, so I'm Latin, right? I, I am a mestiza centroamericana, guatemalteca, and I'm really passionate about things in life. And my personality is passionate. So I kind of like, you know, get passionate and talk and I have big <laughs> eyes and big, yeah, that's who I am. I cannot help it, that this is me. This is who I am. Like when I'm happy, I'm like this. But when I have to address these issues, I really have to come up with a voice and a tone that's appropriate for ye wide ears to listen. And I have to modulate my voice. And I, I start being extra nice and extra supportive because, and here I want to thank you, Ray and Enkem for writing this appeasing uh, article because um, I, I am having a hard time finding these new words that I never needed before. So it's like, I'm translating back, like, I don't know how this word is called in Spanish, like appeasing. And when I find it, I'm like, oh yeah, I know that. So can you talk about appeasing a little bit, Ray? Yeah, sure. Um, but before I go there, I just wanna also name something that I heard you say um, that for me um, translates to, to something that is often referred to as code switching. That we, right, that we have to code switch in, in order to even have a conversation. So there's, there's the initial injury. There's all of the energy that we devote to getting ready 
to have the conversation, to feel safe enough to sort things through. There's the code switching we have to do to have the conversation. I mean, no wonder, no wonder we're exhausted, <laughs> right? It's just, it's so much work. And, and, and Tony Bell, the, the concept that you're referring to that, that Enkem and Defo and I have been um, doing some writing about um, really actually comes from Enkem's work, but, but I've, I've, I was so taken by her um, articulating appeasement as a trauma response that we've begun to have conversations. And as I said, we've done some, some writing on it. And there's, a, there's an article um, on Medium for folks who want to access it, who are interested, um, that sort of represents our sort of initial thinking about this response when, um, when folks are in a situation of ongoing traumatic entrapment. And I use that term very deliberately. It's a, it's a term that um, sort of originated primarily with like kidnapping victims and domestic abuse survivors, but it, it, it's been used to describe what happens and, and the survival skills that come online when someone's in a situation where their aggressor is someone they can't escape from. And so I would, I would argue, for example, in the United States, people of color, for the most part, can't escape from white people. We're ubiquitous, we're everywhere we've got. And so, and, and you know, we could say the same for, you know, queer people like me, that straight people are everywhere. We can't escape just straight people and straight culture, right? And that in those situations, when a microaggression occurs, there's this simultaneous desire to flee that's thwarted because you can't actually ever get away from the people that are committing these microaggressions. There's this simultaneously des desire to move forward and do something, but that's not safe. That's going to have consequences, right? And, and there's sort of this, this experience of um, feeling as though you've got your foot on the gas and on the brakes at the same time. That you're going nowhere, but you're burning all of this gasoline just to stay immobilized in order to stay safe. And so, where Enkem and I have been articulating how appeasing behaviors emerge from that situation where my best survival strategy is to calm you down so that the threat de-escalates. Right. That you if you can't if you can't fight against the threat or escape the threat, how do you de-escalate the threat? And so all of these appeasing behaviors, smiling, making yourself small, looking down. This, I mean, this is where we're really getting into the body now. All of these nonverbal communication strategies that signal, and, and not only in human beings, but in mammals as well, signal, it's okay, I surrender, I'm not a threat, I'm not going to attack you, please leave me alone, please, you know, please stop threatening me. And that the cost of that metabolically. I think it's something that we don't quite ever take into account. We, we talk about trauma response as if it's something that you either, you know, fight or you freeze or you flee, but there's this other thing. And I, I think the other thing about appeasement is that it often is accompanied by feelings of shame. I sh not only, you know, maybe should, I should have stood up for myself, but oh my God, I, I sat there and I, I stood there and I smiled and I agreed with them and I flattered them and I did all of these things. And like, what, the, what am I doing? And, and how um, corrosive that can be 
to one's sense of self and self-esteem and self-pride and integrity, to be in a position where in order to survive, you have to appease people in power on a regular basis. So I think that, I mean, it's, it's sort of one facet of this whole dynamic around microaggressions that I think I think's important to add up and to go, oh, right, that's why I'm exhausted. Or yeah, that's why I second guess myself or I feel bad about these situations, even though I've survived them. So I think to go, I think to go even even deeper in that is, you know, depending on what level of position of power someone is in, you know, you might even get to a point where you feel like you have to feel grateful, you know, for, for how like the relationship with them, uh -huh. you know, be, be, because you may see them as, as a, as a per, like a pertinent person or someone that you may look up to and say, you know, maybe this is a part of the process. Maybe this is a part of the learning experience and you, you know, not only accept it, but then feel like that is a part of how you then are supposed to act and navigate for people, you know, under you when you wind up finding yourself in that position of power. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's this, this there's this carry forward effect. Mm -hmm. And, and on the other side, I think the other thing is that um, many of us are not um, given very much information about or, or particularly aware of the ways in which we fail to recognize when other people are appeasing us. It, mm. it feels so comfortable, right? Like, mm. you no, know, if someone is always complying or always, you know, agreeing with you and smiling at you, like, what are you going to recognize? How are you going to recognize that as a PC? Especially in the context of a classroom where like, if, and if these discussions and like disagreement is not fostered. Yeah. It's hard to disagree, right? And to hold space for allowing disagreement to just like, you know, appear and show itself. It's, so it's, very complicated but because appeasing, um, I understand it as, okay, that image is very eloquent. Like you are like uh, pressing the gas and you're like a hundred miles per hour inside, but outside you're like still and smiling and happy and, you know, accommodating. So it's very similar to what you learn in some uh, meditation techniques. I mean, it's not the same, but it kind of like, it's similar in the sense that you learn to become um, aware of your sensations and you learn to not react to the sensations. So you might be like sitting, meditating and then having this very strong sensation and you just like, I get the difference. I guess the difference is that in meditation, you're becoming aware that you're being triggered inside and you do not react versus in the appeasing portion, you might be, you might not be aware of your inner sensation. So do we resist like that, becoming aware of our sensations and then like adjusting? I'll say yes to that question, but then I wanted to go back to um, just the idea of like disagreement isn't normalized, especially in the classroom. And that's where we, I think the, the bottom line is, is normalizing disagreement, normalizing that there are differences, even though we grew up in this country and there's a highlight of this country being a mixed a mixed pot and still, you know, there's still kind of this, uh, especially in academia, like you are going to, you're sitting in a class to gain from versus give to. Um, and so that culture, it, it sets up the imbalance of me becoming aware of what's going on and then having the tools to then react to it because the culture isn't normalized to react to. 
<laughs> which is which is interesting because as you know as therapists our whole bread and butter is perspective right being able to listen to one another and you know to gain insight on how other people view the world and use those things as tools to be able to say okay I may not understand this because I don't walk in those same shoes or have that same experience, but I can definitely identify, resonate, and empathize with you in that way. And to be able to utilize uh, utilize that as information to create more fruitful dialogue. So ab absolutely, I, th I think that goes back to that power dynamic of, you know, I am here to teach you, you are here to listen, opposed to, you know, that the fluid conversation where you gain information, I allow you to understand my perspective of the information and then I utilize it in a way that's conducive to how I need to utilize that information, if that makes sense. Yeah, but, but teachers come with this attitude um, of not opening up to us students. Like, I, that's my perspective, my perspective, that's my perception, that's how I feel, that I do not get the truth the, the authentic uh, person that comes in front of me, but they are like this very well poised and very eloquent, you know, and smart persons that are teaching me and giving me, as you said, Danica, the knowledge that I lack. So I would love to have more spaces where like you can, we can all, you know, offer what we have and come as students in this, what, horizontal space where we can, you know, like, and that would also lift a shift of responsibility, like shift the responsibility, the weight of responsibility on the teacher to just be perfect and know it all and be able to do everything right. It, because they're humans too. Like, why would they want to have this image of perfection if we're humans and we're bound to, you know, make mistakes? Yeah. So how does that happen in a classroom? I, 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 I would like to, you know, believe being on both ends of the spectrum as a, you know, um, adjunct professor and as a student, um, that there's this hard, fine balance, right, between being the person who everyone is looking to you for information um, but also trying to be fluid in how that information is given so that everybody is receiving the same type of structure. Um, and and it's, it's honestly really quite difficult, right? Because, you know, I, I, I would like to believe that the structure is there so that everyone is receiving it the same way and no one feels slighted, but also we all understand that everyone learns differently and how do you create a curriculum or a, a workspace where everyone is getting the individual needs met without feeling slighted and still being able to receive all the information that as a professor I know to be pertinent to your growth as you know a student and a future clinician. Um, so it's, it's, it's this weird weaving dance of where where do I where do I find that sweet spot of being able to be true and authentic without and I think also this the anxiety of if I leave too much space for ambiguity, does does that show that I'm not um, as educated or insightful about this topic that I know I you know th that I know I am to be? Um, so it, it's it's a difficult you know um, dance to do. Uh, I, I think it just it takes time and, and effort, but I, I think it. I'm I'm sure that there has been a space where that has happened before, and it's like no this doesn't work because there's too many complaints around people not getting the, the core structure of it. So how do we get it so everybody is even across the board? Um, but again, we also know that, that may, that's not always conducive. So just trying to find a, a happy medium. And I think, you know, to your point, um, Ray, just, or I mean, to your point, uh, Tony Bell, just being okay with trial and error and recognizing that that's also a part of the work that we do too, is being able to see, hey, how, how can we try this thing out where everybody's on the same page about what's happening um, and nobody feels slighted about what they're getting? Because the reality of it is as a student, I'm paying for an education. Um, <laughs> and so I, I want it to be done a certain way, but also as an instructor, I also know that the education isn't solely in the books and it's also in the engagement and dialogue, the transparency, the rapport that, that you build and being able to you know, get the whole bang for your buck where students feel like they're getting their money's worth where while also I feel like I'm giving the information that, that they need. 
thinking about this idea of like being like nobody feeling slighted and I don't know if that's possible it feels like default curriculum as it is is already a slight like that's why Hannah created this group (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I I in some of my experiences in classrooms I I share that value I don't want anybody in the classroom to be slighted but there are times in which like discomfort and being slighted, like they feel so related sometimes. And mm-hmm. like we step away from discomfort and also like in speaking in particular, I'm thinking about particular classes, like sometimes white students' voices are like the loudest in numbers and in their like speaking up about discomfort. And so then that creates like anything that was that like, you know, I'm making this adjustment to my curriculum because I want it to be tied to these social justice values or whatever it is, that causes discomfort in white students. And then they voice that discomfort and like, yeah, nobody wants that discomfort to exist so blatantly and it's back down. But then like the default is still, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, sometimes it feels like a little bit more acceptable for students of color to be in discomfort in the classroom, mm-hmm. to take risks and make changes that might make white students uncomfortable is not the whole solution, but it keeps us from the trial and error that we're trying to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the impact, uh, students of color um, have had more impact regarding uh, the microaggressions, the lived microaggressions, right? So it's accumulated. And uh, that's something that I'm still uh, acknowledging and grasping because for me, it has been a recent experience. Like I started naming and experiencing microaggressions when I came to the US uh, as an international student. Uh, I look white, so in Guatemala, my skin has never been, uh, you know, questioned or looked at or talked about or if anything to say like oh how beautiful you look like a gringuita and that's it right so coming here these two last years were so impactful because I'm like looking at my peers of color and asking like how do you deal with this like how do you deal with this? I have not dealt with this before. How do you deal with this? It's overwhelming. And I would and and I would be one of the peers that she would ask, how do you deal with this? <laughs> and I would I think I I don't know what exactly I said in that mo- moment, but I think I said something along the lines of it's almost like we norm it's it's normal to feel the being slighted all the time. It's almost like, you know, uh, to 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 even put into words is is a little traumatic and triggering. So even being asked like how do you deal with it means going way back in in time in my mind even past my my existence to my lineage going back then and in feeling how felt um it is to be a black woman a person of color uh in in this in this in this country so um it's just it's such a a a really powerful question um to ask uh, a person of color The question itself puts a finger on the wound. Yeah, yeah. So how we how with the finger placed on the wound, like what do we do? Like because um, we're learning our crafts, right? We're becoming um, um, art therapists, dance movement therapists, music therapists, and. Um, 
I guess what I'm curious about is like knowing what we know about creativity and movement and uh, I don't know, imagination and knowing what we know about the body and how it keeps, you know, uh, trauma. Like what are the things that you do in your personal lives to, you know, to adjust, to, to cope? I would I would say for me, um, I mean, outside of obviously, you know, just the eating and stuff like like regular general coping skills. Um, if we're speaking specifically around, you know, like microaggressions and things like that, I, I believe that my coping skill is to just accentuate my my culture in every space that I'm in to normalize it. You know, like if I if I ever find myself in a space where I feel like I am not being myself, I over I over bring myself. You know, just just to make that point of like. I'm here and this is who I am and this is okay and acceptable. I think that, you know, we, we think about microaggressions and how they're, they can be very subconscious. And I think that we have been conditioned to be, believe, you know, like if, and I guess this goes back to that, you know, point of how do people, you know, sometimes not feel slighted in the, in the you know, teaching space where I think sometimes even people of color may um, default to what professionalism looks like and it looks white. So if it doesn't look that way, then we feel like we're not getting that professional setting. When in reality, we're getting the same information. It's just being presented to us in a, in a different way that's more connected to our culture and who we are. Um, and so I think for me, my coping skill is, again, just to normalize who I am, what I represent, and to bring that into the classroom setting, whether it's teaching, whether it's being a student. Um, so that other students feel comfortable being able to normalize those spaces so that to your point for Hannah that it can be conducive and we can find ourselves in a, in a learning space where everyone can be themselves and still get the pertinent information that they can take in their careers. And I would even add that 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 second part of you like bringing it into the space and normalizing is is an act of act, like activism. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Love that. You know, listen, my students will tell you, I come in bonnet on, music blasting, it, it <laughs> you, you know, because that, that, that is okay too. F figure mm -hmm. out how to, you know, rapport building, right? Like yeah. figure out how to connect, figure out, you know, how to make people feel comfortable in showing up authentically themselves and, and you, and you won. Because if we're thinking about the work that we do, that's a part, like we, we live parallel lives in terms of who we are versus the work that we do. And so if we can't show up in the classroom space authentically ourselves and be able to talk about our differences and biases and microaggressions and how do we figure out how to make those issues and thoughts conducive to the work that we're doing for other people who may be experiencing those things. You know, so just being the person to, to break the ice in that way. Um, Blair, I'm, I'm just, I'm really enjoying um, your description of your response because I relate to it so much in, in, in my own way. Um, I remember a, a, a time, I live in a very white, straight, affluent town. And I, I've noticed my own body image, particularly my clothing, sort of subtly unconsciously drifting to straight white cis norms, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I just like, just, you know, you know, sort of one article of clothing at a time over the years, just sort of, you know, drifting toward that, that place that I've resisted, that I resist, you know, so, so vehemently in my own, in my own sense of who I am. But I remember one day showing up just, I was just downtown shopping and I, and I happened to be looking particularly genderqueer just by kind of by accident. And I got the dirty look up and down from someone who was standing in line in front of me with, with her kid. And she just gave me this like, who the bleep are you? And why are you dressed like that? And, and I did the same thing, Blair. I doubled down. Oh, I went to class the next day as queer <laughs> as I could get. <laughs> nice. I, 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 I specifically remember uh, uh, when I graduated from undergrad um, and, you know, again, this whole idea of what professionalism is, I come in, suited down, shoes on, socks real nice, fresh cologne, my, my gap and gown on, 
And I remember coming into the like stadium and I remember seeing this this uh this white student with jean shorts and flip-flops on in the graduation. And that was the moment where I told myself that I do not care <laughs> what mm -hmm. I look like because if this student can come in and show up the way that he wants to, then why can't I? Why yeah. should I be ashamed of how I show up and how I present myself, especially if it's culturally in, uh, conducive to who I am and represents you know, what makes me comfortable? Um, and and I, I take that with me I, I, every time I think about, am I dressing professionally? You know, what do I look like? I, I go to families' houses with the hoodie on and Nike sneakers on because that is what they relate to. Um, and, and, I, and I think that, again, it's just important for us to truly think about who our audience is and, and who we want our audience to be and to showcase that so that younger generations know that this is okay. That this, is, this is acceptable. You're a role model. Oh. <laughs> but, but we all are every time we choose to resist mm -hmm. and make that resistance visible to others mm -hmm. somebody on the street goes damn look at that look at that I could do that mm -hmm. right students in your classroom mm -hmm. I could do that I could show up to session looking like that talking like that whatever it is Right. No, no one would look at me and think that I am two years away from getting a doctorate, and and that and that is and that is okay because I think it it induces conversation and again it normalizes the idea of you know what professionalism and what you know academia and success looks like, and it's, and so I, and so I, I flaunt that. So when people do engage, and that's why I'm friendly. When people do engage me, we have those dialogues, and it's like, wait, huh? You you look like you're 18. <laughs> and you and you dress like you're 16. What, what's happening here? And it's like that's that's how I present, you know. And and just getting people normalized into you know not judging a book by its cover and really just talking to people and and having those dialogues and whew, yes, all right. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. Authenticity, authenticity, uh, authenticity, for sure. authenticity. For sure. Yeah. So we're approaching our end. Um, this, uh, this uh, I'm feeling sad because we're gonna have to say goodbye for now. But this has been like an amazing uh, moment, uh, conversation um, weaving. And I think uh, this type of conversations, um, I want to keep on uh, engaging in this. Like, so I will probably invite you to another, uh, conversation. I don't know where, I don't know when, but definitely um, it's very comforting to have uh, somebody else uh, navigate with you the experiences uh, that you're having and um, putting words to it, like, you know, jumping from the pre-verbal to like, oh, this is this and we resist and together it's easier. So does anyone have uh, any question uh, for the, the people, our audience, if anyone wants to um, pop a question in the chat or, you know, raise your voice on mute. I shared in the chat box uh, the article that Ray was talking about in, about the peacement piece. So you can find it there. And um, I don't know if anyone has one last words some last words before we close up for today. I do have one one thought, um, and you know, going back to the whole authenticity piece and kind of answering your question, like, what do you do when you're when you are triggered? And and I think also normalizing not knowing what to do and normalizing that you're still in the process of figuring figuring how out how to go from pre-verbal to verbal. Yeah. I think along those lines, like we have choice, you know, like my friend recently, I, she's working through something, like she has a work conflict that she's working through. And, and she was saying like, I think I've realized that feedback is a love language. And, mm -hmm. and like, if I'm taking the time and effort to tell you how you, how you've hurt me, it's because I, care about our relationship and I'm I'm like coming here to strengthen it and so 
knowing that not every relationship has to be the like ultimate relationship, I think that has been freeing for me in knowing that I have choice in when to engage and when not to engage. And when it's, it's okay to sometimes not engage, it doesn't mean, I mean, all of that weight. And I think like a lot of what we talked about today, like the integrity pieces and like, if I don't say something, what does that mean? I'm, all of that still comes up, but ultimately we all have choice about what conversations we engage in. So as long as, long as you can sit with yourself and, and be at peace with the choice that you make, then make whatever choice is, conducive to you and what your needs are in that moment just as long as you can be at peace with that choice for sure yeah the, the choose your battles right um peace like choose whatever battles and um thank you ray for for accepting the invitation and thank you blair thanks uh, janika and for hannah and hannah for um wanting to be here uh, opening up and yeah, I feel a lot of gratitude as well. And thank you for the comments. Thank you, Christina. Uh, feedback is a love language. Yeah, Farhana, you're excited there. Mm -hmm. Sonia Lopez, my friend, Sonia Lopez, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense just to see what, with whatever it's coming from the other people, from the other person and be open and just allow for discomfort and allow for um, uncomfortable sensations and just be okay with not everyone engaging as you would like to and uh, being compassionate towards yourself as well. Okay, so there are some uh, comments in the chat. Thank you for drawing our attention to appeasement and application point. That if I notice someone appeasing, I may actually be committing a microaggression and not aware of it. Yeah. Can you provide me the contact information for cats of color? DPT students are interested in forming a group for students of color and would appreciate learning from you. Hannah, Kate Mitchell. That's, you can talk, Kate. You should talk with Hannah. Um, thank you to everyone for sharing this great and important conversation. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you all for being vulnerable and honest and authentically you. Yeah, Nicolette. Um, yeah, so we still have three minutes if there are some last, last words. Look about time management. Like, wow, yeah, right, <laughs> excellent weaver. Oh, yes, so good, yes. Tony Bell. Um, yes. I might, I might finish with, with two thoughts, which I think I'll actually combine into, into one. Um, just, a, we were having a conversation about how, um, how important it is in a, when, when we find ourselves in a position of power to invite dissent, right? Again, I think inviting dissent, like you were saying, Blair, it really models a, a way to engage that starts to um, disrupt those power differentials that can come with the roles that we're in. And so I might just say that I think that that's one of the things that teachers can do. Rather than just accept dissent when it comes our way, actually invite it. Like in the classroom say, so anyone have a different opinion? Anyone disagree with that? And normalize dissent, not as this awful fraught, you know, difficult, where this is a problem, but dissent as a, as a learning process. And so I, I think we can do that. And to be honest with you, where I learned that was as a therapist, because I think that that's one of the pieces that <laughs> as a therapist can be so that's important, <laughs> so important. To, to learn how to do, how do we support our clients to disagree with us? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will leave with um, be fearless in your learning. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to get the right answer, but it's another thing to know all of the wrong answers and why your, you know, answer was right. Um, don't be afraid to fail. 
um, because that is where you get the most information um, is, and that is where you are able to internalize and empathize more. Um, even, even if it seems hard, you know, don't be, a, it's everything is a learning experience. And if you take, and if you take that approach, you can be fearless in how you, you know, tackle topics, situations, and, and even grow in your own self. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds good. And um, well, it's um, five uh, now. You, you know, U.S. American education has really implanted me the time management. <laughs> that if I did not have it before. Now I have it. Like, see, sharp on time. Not Guatemalan time. Just U.S. Certified <laughs> time. So let's say goodbye. I'll play my colorful lights of uh, faith I'll play uh, I know the music I love it I love it yeah well thank you all for a wonderfully engaging conversation thanks for joining us for today's Tuesday topic uh, please join us next week and for the rest of the quarter we got a lot of really great sessions coming up and we hope to see you there thank you so much